How's that drink? It's pretty good. I wouldn't say it's my favorite, but for it being my first creamy cocktail, I've been enjoying it. Your first creamy cocktail? I don't think I've ever had a creamy cocktail. Not that I remember, but I've also been drinking for a while. I love them. They're so good. And oh, and that's probably my favorite because mm. um, it's got the rum, the soda with the carbonation and sweetness, mm. and then the the Kahlua, even more sweetness with the I coffee. Do like Kahlua. The root beer is good. The coffee Coke works really good with it, too. It's all coffee flavored. And then just the heavy cream. Just a little bit of heavy cream. Not Meg. It's like a Christmassy, creamy coffee. Perfect. My name is Paige. Zach is my name. There you go. <laughs> this episode is on kids who kill, murder of children. Creepy. Kids who do the killing. I was looking online and obviously I wasn't going to cover any cases yeah. of this because that's yours. Excellent. But I was looking through some of them and they were sending chills down my spine. Mm -hmm. It was like, Jesus. Yeah. Yeah, bro. Oh. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm excited to hear some of the stuff that you have to cover. I've got some background on murder in general, um, and this is a special, uh, special, um, dark themed video episode of Beard Fear, where I don't know if you could see on the monitor there. It's very dark. It's very, very mood dark. lit. Very dark in here. Mood lighting. This is a Christmas tree. And then we've got the Christmas tree to Grimo. my left. Uh, Mary Chrysler. Fading from blue to white. It looks beautiful. <laughs> this room. Did I tell you I got you your Christmas present picked up? You did. Do you want to know what it is? No. Come on. You did. I'm nervous because I, I was looking for ideas for yours and I was deciding on a few things and then I had to actually like do my job at work. So. Mm. Come on. I know. Let me tell you. No. No. That's, that ruins the fun. Um, Can I tell you what your birthday gift is? No. No. Stop it. I'm bad at keeping gifts. You really gifts, are. Gift secrets. I'm bad. I get excited. I need to pick. Did I tell you what I was giving my dad? No. I got him an autographed oh, golf yeah, ball. Oh, yeah, you did. You yeah, did. from his childhood, one of his childhood favorite golfers. It's a master's ball. Do they listen to this? My parents? No. Okay, good. No, that's not their thing. They just support me. Mm -hmm. And then I got my mom a bath pillow because that's what she asked for. Mom's hard to shop for. Yeah. My sister's got her shit that's nice too. Lacey got her um, a picture. It's a heart necklace. And if you get close to it, you can put a picture in it. So it's not like a locket. So she got her a picture of her and her mom and her sister together. Oh, that's cute. And then Emily got my dad, uh, or she got my mom a necklace as well. Uh -huh. But she got my dad um, a plaque. With a picture of him and grandma together with like a prayer on it. Oh. Yeah. Good gifts. I also got him a, a hat from his all-time favorite golfer. That's right. I wanted to get him an autographed thing from his all-time favorite golfer and that was like a thousand dollars. Yeah. Crazy expensive. Some of the gifts I was looking at for you. <laughs> yeah. Don't. Don't do that. I, I have some ideas and I'll have to look through them again. Your but... birthday gift is expensive enough. But <laughs> one of the gifts, because I was thinking about getting you... Autographed drumsticks from Pearl Jam. $3,000. And very hard to find. Yes, I... Plus, I was very suspicious of the authenticity of it. And if I'm going to get something that's authentic... Yeah, gonna you're going to pay that much for it. It's got to be authentic. I mean, I don't know how often Matt Cameron does autographs for things. Mm. Well, I was looking at everyone. Because, like, you know, they sign random things oh, all the yeah, time. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I was, right. I was just looking at Pearl Jam in general. And I was like, maybe I'll get, like, an Eddie Vedder thing. Eddie Vedder stuff is very expensive. Yes, it is. Even posters. Yeah, and I was looking at like prints and like old school posters, like original posters from like concerts. They're very pricey. Yeah. And there's not a lot. There is not a lot of Pearl Jam autograph stuff out there because most people that get it keep it. Yes. And Pearl Jam is very, Pearl Jam specifically is very against that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's why they don't do that stuff a whole lot to begin Makes with. Sense. 
they don't want people just selling it for for cash. So. Yeah. But uh, I'm doing the thing again that I've been doing the past couple of Christmases is making a bunch of gifts for everyone. Mm -hmm. And I still have one to work on. I'm actually excited for the gift because you perfected it. There's there yeah, there's everyone's getting two things. But um I'm also getting What's a, the second thing? It's I'm still working on it. Oh. Um but, You told me what the first thing was, why can't you tell me the second thing? I don't wanna have to censor more stuff out. That's Just... <laughs> push the mic away. I'll I'll tell you after okay. we're done. But um I'm getting a few other people like some other things. So I, I need to start looking for stuff because it is coming up quick and mm -hmm. if you don't buy it this coming week, you're not going to get it in time. Yeah, I know. And uh, I hate ordering things Thank online. Thank God for and, Amazon Prime. And I don't want to support Amazon. And I hate buying things online. But uh, it's fine. I'm trying not to stress for the holidays. They always stress me out. But uh, I guess the highlight of my week besides work, which isn't really a highlight. Well, I had a week of not training, which was great. Yeah. But um, <clears throat> I went to Mater's uh, today Yeah. <laughs> with I Ollie. I go. Um, what? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we should definitely go. It's it's a lot of fun. Uh, for people who don't know, Mater's is a historic, uh, really nice German, authentic German restaurant in Milwaukee, mm -hmm. Wisconsin. And it's been around since 1902. And I want to go. They have a lot of really that good German food. so good. They have uh, an amazing beer selection and wine selection and really, really good cocktails. Their desserts are pretty good, too. But the whole vibe is great, too. So her and I went up there. We took the two-hour drive to Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. At Mater's, took two hour drive back down here, and now we're recording a podcast. And uh, that was the highlight of my week that I'm willing to disclose on <laughs> our recorded format. Uh, what about you? I just worked and saw my family on Sunday. I'm consistent. We had some nice dinner. I went over. Did I go over? I didn't spend the night this week. What did we have? We had nice lunch. We had some Subway. We had, I haven't had Subway in years. We had uh, some, what did we have for dinner? Pizza. Yeah, we had pizza. It was good. Oh, yeah. Uh, but work was good all week. I'm in the middle of marathoning the Avengers. That's right. Chronologically. How's that going? Uh, we are on movie 16. Damn. Yeah, we do. We average like a movie and a half a night. Wow. Mm-hmm. That's insane. Yeah, we're, uh, we're in the middle of Doctor Strange right now. I still have to see that. It's a good movie. I have not seen it yet. It is definitely a different take. Uh, as far as superhero movies go, because it's not a hundred percent about the action, and it's got a lot of visuals that are very appealing. Hmm. Yeah, that was that was my week, man. Short and simple, to the point. Excellent. Our beer. That's it's from it. Pipeworks. It's not. <laughs> I almost bought a Pipeworks beer because it looked really interesting, and I really wanted to try it because I think it was a coffee beer. Ooh. Yeah, I was gonna try it, but I wanted to try something different, something we haven't done before. Okay, new beers. They get uh, not a new beer, but a new brewery. Mm -hmm. Our brewery, our beer is from Short Fruit Fuse Brewing. I don't think we've done them. Short Fruit Fuse. Short Fuse. <laughs> Short Fuse. Short Fuse Brewing. Donde esta? It is located in the village of Schiller Park, Illinois. Short Fuse Brewing Company is a production brewery and tap room with a full kitchen. You'll be able to find us right next to the entertainment mecca of Rosemont and right on River Road, less than a mile south of the Fashion Outlet Mall. Mm. <clears throat> They're also only five minutes from the O'Hare Terminals. We craft our beer on a... 30 barrel brew house and 30 barrel fermenters. We also will feature a large barrel program for aging beers. In addition, we are one of a few breweries in Illinois to feature two 30 uh, barrel fodders? Fooders? Fodders. Fodders. Fooders. Wait, no, I think they're fooders. They're fooders. A fooder yeah. is a giant oak vat typically used to age wine. But recently, beer breweries have started using them. The main purpose of our fooders will be to age sours and wild beers. Some will age 12 to 18 months. Damn. They're not offering brewery tours right now, unfortunately. Mm. I'm looking at pictures, and it looks really cool. The secret to our success. It's quite simple, really. Three words. Quality craft beer. That's it. It may not be simple to get our standard of beer, but for us, it's second nature. It's our passion. It's kind of our thing. Mm. The difference is in our classic brewing style mixed with our own little creative flair. The result? A taste so crisp, bold, original, and dare we say explosive. Whoa. You will have to taste it to believe it. We're about to. 
location, 5000 North River Road, Schiller Park. 60176. I know exactly where that fashion outlet is because we drove by it on the way back. Here. Well, hey. Yeah, that's, uh, I didn't know there was a brewery out that way. There is not a lot of information out there about their beers. If you click on their beer list, it's literally just what's on tap. And I don't even think the beer that I picked is on their list. Okay. I had to go to their Facebook. And I also had to go to Untapped to get a description. Yeah. Our beer is called Very Bad Kids. <laughs> 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 thought that was apt. That works. It is a flavored sour ale. Yes. It came out March 10th of 2020. Okay. Or, I'm sorry. 2021? Yeah, 2021. Yeah, this okay. year. For, yeah, March 10th, 2021. Very Bad Kids is a fruited sour made with watermelon, sour patch kids, and watermelon puree. Whoa. Oh, sour patch kids. I see. It does not have a beer advocate page. Okay. It has an untapped page. Uh, the ABV is 5.5%. I'm excited to try sour beer. That is beer literally again. all I could find on it. Totally fine. Watermelon. I think the flavor of watermelon will be strong with this one because it's a sour, and I imagine fruit to be pretty present in sour, so I'm excited. I'm excited for it just because it says watermelon patch sour patch kids. That sounds interesting. You know, I'm upset there's not more information on it. I'm not a fan of sour patch kids just eating them on their own. I've never had one. You've never had a sour patch kid. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. That's crazy to think. I'm not like a huge fan of sour things. I, don't, I like sour ales though. I like sour ales. I'm not a fan of like fruit gummy candies. Not my thing. Yeah, I used to really love the gummy lifesavers though. I still like those. Those are those good. are one of the exceptions. And Twizzlers. Those are like my go-to like fruity, Twizzlers. chewy, gummy candies. Yeah. Anything else like Because I guess, I guess they're technically not really gummy. Twizzlers aren't really. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like fruit-flavored yeah. candy. But like Dots or like Starburst, Laffy Taffy, things like that. Mike and Ike's. No. Took a food break. I was hungry. And we're back. Better than ever. Back with the beer. Short fuse. Brewing company, very, very, far away. very short arms. Thank you. Very bad kids. These are very warm. And that's not warm. Feels warm. No. Flavored sour ale. I, be I bet it's the perfect temperature. I like your optimism. 200 pounds of watermelon puree. 200 pounds? 200 pounds. Do you like the, there's like a little, little goats, little angry goats. Evil goats. They're like posing <laughs> and fighting. It's got a dunce hat. Dunce hat. Feels like they're gonna explode. Jeez. Oh, that is over the top watermelon. Whoa. Foam's coming out of there. Slow pour. Oh, wow. Whoa. <laughs> Look at that shit. <laughs> I didn't even pour aggressively. That is pure foam. It's all foam. Well, this is going to take a while. There's an inch of liquid in this glass. Yeah, two-thirds of mine is foam. What? You have, yeah, an inch of... Fuck. <laughs> Why is this Half your so... glass is full, but there's an inch Why of beer. Why is this so foamy? It's all the watermelon. It's all the sugar from the watermelon. Jesus. They did say 200 pounds of watermelon puree. Yeah, they did. They were not choking. So it's like when I... Remember when I uh, used to make kombucha? And yeah. when you used real fruit for like the second fermentation and you kept it shut and let it ferment at room temp that shit would get so fizzy because all of all the sugars in the um in the fruit puree fruit puree fruit parade it looks like a guinness with the uh you can't really see because it's so damn dark in here but with all the you see, can you see that look at my beer yeah what? all that yeah. shit rising up looks like mountain dew all right we're, we're still working on the pour like somebody peed in the glass <laughs> By the time we're, we've got a full glass of beer, it's going to be warm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it smells like sweet and sour watermelon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you don't drink Guinness, so... Um, but you ever see that when you pour a Guinness in a glass and all the... You see all the carbonation rising up? Yeah. The nitrogen? That's exactly what this looks like. Just in... Remember for our picture for the beer and food? Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a, a clear golden version. All right, I got almost a full glass. <laughs> Color is very light. Looks like a lager. In this light, it looks darker than it actually is under like a an actual bright light. 
but it's it's a light beer, very foamy, got a lot of a lot of bubbles. You can see that again. More bubbles than I've ever seen from a beer. And the the head sticks around. It was it was five sixths of our beer when we first poured it. it. Smells like watermelon, sweet and sour. They gave me goosebumps. Whoa. It just attacks your palate. You know when you have something really sour and you get yes. the Yep. Mm-hmm. I mean, I taste the watermelon. It's like I'm sucking on sour watermelon candy. Yeah. The taste is just like the smell. Sweet and sour watermelon. It's watermelon forward, I would say. <laughs> Extremely carbonated. Very fizzy. Tingly. Mm-hmm. I didn't get a burp. It's watermelon. The whole beer. Ooh. Ooh. What is that? Probably watermelon. Oh, it's watermelon. <laughs> no, there's something on the on the back end that it was like a, a spice. I got extreme goosebumps from that. Just initial reaction was just goose pimples. Almost like a vanilla? I don't get a vanilla. At the end? There's something at the end. I don't know, dude. Where it's like creaminess almost, but uh yeah, it's like, it tastes like a watermelon sour patch kid. Yeah, there's not a lot of in-depth behind it. It's just, I, we constantly complain about how there's not enough flavor. Exactly. And that is a lot of flavor. Murder. Hoi. Is Murder. the unlawful moida. Moida. Is the unlawful killing of another human without justification or valid excuse. What? Especially. I know. Especially the unlawful killing of another human with malice afterthought. Without valid excuse. Without justification or valid excuse. <laughs> okay. Your Honor, <laughs> I know I murdered someone, but I have a good reason. It could potentially hold up in court. The state, this state of mind may, depending on, upon the jurisdiction, distinguish murder from other forms of unlawful homicide, such as manslaughter. Manslaughter is killing committed in the absence of malice, mm -hmm. brought about by reasonable provocation or diminished capacity. Involuntary manslaughter, where it is recognized as a killing that lacks all but the most attenuated guilty intent, recklessness. Most societies consider murder to be an extremely serious crime, and thus that a person convicted of murder should receive harsh punishments for the purposes of retribution, deterrence, rehabilitation, or incapacitation. In most countries, a person convicted of murder generally faces a long-term prison sentence, a life sentence, or even capital punishment. Mm -hmm. Bring back capital punishment. Bring it back. Didn't you say that at the live show? No, I said bring back public, uh, public hangings. Oh, okay. I mean, that's a very specific form of capital punishment, but... <laughs> the elements of common law murder are unlawful killing through criminal act or omission, failure to act, of a human by another human with malice afterthought. And malice afterthought can be the intent to kill... The intent to inflict grievous bodily harm short of death. Reckless indifference to an unjustifiably high risk to human life, sometimes described as abandoned and malignant heart. Mm -hmm. Or intent to commit a dangerous felony. Gotcha. So those four things uh, make up ma ma um, malice afterthought. Okay. Murder is generally divided by degrees. Mm -hmm. Second degree murder is common law murder and first degree is an aggravated form. Factors depend on the jurisdiction, but may include a specific intent to kill, premeditation, or deliberate, deliberation okay. for aggravated. Strangulation, poisoning, or lying in wait are also treated as first degree in others. Some states in the U.S. also have third degree murder mm -hmm. and distinguish premeditated murder as a separate degree. So it depends on the state, depends on your country. Exclusions may include killings in war. Not all killings in war, but most killings in war. Self-defense, which is justifiable homicide. Unlawful killings without malice or intent, which is manslaughter, mm -hmm. and accidental killings, homicides, and suicide. Okay. Suicide is not murder. Uh, some countries allow conditions that affect the balance of the mind to be regarded as mitigating circumstances. This means a person may be found guilty of manslaughter on the basis of diminished responsibility rather than being found guilty of murder if it can be proved that the killer was suffering from a condition that affected their judgment at the time. Depression, PTSD, and medication side effects are some examples that can be taken into account. Other mitigating circumstances include insanity, postpartum depression, 
unintentional killings uh, for killing to be considered murder in nine out of 50 states in the U.S., there normally needs to be an element of intent. Uh-huh. And uh, diminished capacity, which is a defense which alleges the killer's mental capacity was diminished at the time of the killing. Dr. Peter Morrall argues that the motivations for murder fit into the following four categories. Lust, love, loathing, or loot. A lot of L's. He also argues that a motive alone is insufficient to explain criminal killing as people can experience those impulses without killing. He insists that certain risk factors may increase the chances that somebody will commit murder. They include, not limited to, testosterone, Mm -hmm. correlated with competitive and assertive behavior, reduction in serotonin, which increases the likelihood of impulsive hostile behavior. I have a lot of lack of serotonin. Alteration in the breakdown of glucose, which appears to affect mood and behavior. Hyperglycemia and hypoglycemia can both lead to aggression. Consumption of alcohol can lead to reduced self-control. Environmental pollutants circulating in the body, which is linked to heightened aggression. And malnutrition from eating too much junk food. Interesting. Which can provoke aggressive behavior. Certain personality disorders are also associated with an increased homicide rate, most notably narcissistic, antisocial, and histrionic personality disorders, and those associated with psychopathology. Uh-huh. According to scholar Peter, Piet, Pieter, Pieter Spierenberg, homicide rates per 100,000 in Europe have fallen over the centuries from 35 per 100,000 in medieval times to 20 in 1500 A.D., Five in 1700 to below two per 100,000 in 1900. Hmm. In the United States, murder rates have been higher and have fluctuated. They fell below two per 100,000 by 1900, rose during the first half of the century, dropped in the years following World War II, and bottomed out at four in 1957 before rising again. The rate stayed in nine to 10 range most of the period from uh, 1972 to 1984 before falling to 5% in present times. Mm-hmm. The increase since 1957 would have been even greater if not for the significant improvements in medical techniques and emergency response times, which mean that more and more attempted homicide victims survive. According to one estimate, if the lethality levels of criminal assaults of 1964 still applied in 1993, the country would have seen the murder rate of around 26 per 100,000, almost triple the actually observed rate of 9.5 per 100,000. I got some stats, Mm -hmm. if that wasn't enough for you. The UNODC, which is the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, 2012 murder rates per 100,000, and it's separated by region. So the Americas is 16, averages 16.3, which is the highest of 100,000. So that's a total of um, 157,000 homicides Mm -hmm. in 2012. Africa has a rate of 12.5 of 135,000 homicides. The world overall average is 6.2 per 100,000 people in 2012, which is 437,000. Europe has a rate of 3 per 100,000 with 22,000 homicides. Wow, we have a high number. Uh, Americas count, uh, obviously, Canada and Mexico also. Um, Europe is three. Uh, Oceania is also three mm-hmm. with 1,100 murders. And then Asia is the lowest at 2.9 with 122,000. Interesting. It also had a list of intentional homicide victims per 100,000 inhabitants from the UNODC um, taken from different years. And there's different sources for these. There's a total of 195 countries listed. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> I'll quickly list off the first 20 and the last 20. El, uh, the first one is El Salvador, uh-huh. has the highest murder rate of 52, huh. 52 per 100,000 people. Then the U.S. Virgin Islands, Jamaica, Lesotho, Honduras, Belize, Venezuela, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, South Africa, St. Kitts and Nevis, Nigeria, Bahamas, Trinidad and Tobago, Mexico is number 14, Anguilla, uh, St. Martin, Brazil, Dominica, Colombia, and Guatemala. Hmm. Those are the top 20. Uh, The bottom 20, Brunei, China, Norway, Slovenia, Palestine, United Arab Emirates, Indonesia, Qatar, Japan, Luxembourg, Macau, Oman, Senegal, Senegal, Singapore, Andorra, Channel Islands, Holy Sea, Isle of Man, Monaco, St. Helena, and San Marino is the last. Monaco. Correct. Uh, The United States is ranked number 74. 
in that list with a murder rate of five per every 100,000 people with a total of 16,214 murders in 2018. Hmm. So per 2018 stats, we have a murder rate of five for every 100,000, where Mexico has a rate of 29.1 hmm. in 2018. There was an analysis done in 1974 by K.S.W. Brennan that investigated a group of 11 child and adolescent murders with regard to various factors such as mental health and domestic relations. The abstract was eight of the 11 children had over-dominant mothers. All had normal intelligence, all were found physically and mentally well, and none suffered from fits, mm -hmm. and all had normal personalities. And then a separate study was uh, published in the American Journal of Psychiatry in 1985. Uh, this is the abstract. The authors document the childhood neuropsychiatric and family characteristics of nine male subjects who were clinically evaluated as, as adolescents and were later arrested for murder. Those subjects are compared with 24 incarcerated delinquents who did not go on to commit violent offenses. The future murderers displayed a constellation of biopsychosocial characteristics that included psychotic symptoms, major neurological, neurological impairment, a psychotic first-degree relative, violent acts during childhood, and severe physical abuse. The authors relate this combination of factors to prediction of violence that discuss ethical issues that are involved in intervention to prevent violence. The results of that study, the nature of the homicidal acts of the nine murderers and the quality of their juvenile violent behaviors are summarized in an attached table. All nine had manifested extreme violence as children and adolescents. In most cases, there was evidence that extreme violence had occurred several years before the commission of murder. For example, one boy had committed multiple sexual acts at least five years before committing murder. Another robbed at knife point 10 years before committing murder, and another assaulted a woman with a knife and robbed her three years before committing murder. At least four of the boys who later murdered were extraordinarily violent in early childhood. One burned his bed when he was four years old. Another was too violent to be permitted into grade school and required instruction at home starting at age 10. Another threatened a teacher with a razor at age 10, and another choked a bird at age two and threw a dog out of a window at age four. Jesus. Yeah, I told you when I was looking at some of these cases, some of this sh it shit's fucked up, man. But based on what I read, the little information that I read in these two studies, I think what it the main thing what it comes down to is the quality of life that you have when you're growing up mm -hmm. and how well your parents are, how well they treat you, how well they raise you. And that has a big, big, big influence on how you grow up as a child and what kind of person you turn into. Mm -hmm. If your childhood is damaged in some way, it it will increase those chances. That's not uh, a surprise. It shouldn't be a surprise at all. But I, I believe the first study that talked about over-dominant mothers and then the um, second study that talked about ch uh, children who had violent tendencies before they committed murder. Um, and those two things led to them murdering. Hmm. I thought that was interesting, reading those. Um, but I think it comes down to how you're raised, ultimately. That's Is my section. section. Oh, okay. You've got specific cases? I do, but I also have something else. So I'm going to open with that, and then I will get into the cases. Perfect. Whether it's nature or nurture, what makes someone a killer is something that's long been debated by psychiatrists. That question is even trickier when you apply it to child murderers. How does an innocent young person turn into a cold-hearted killer? Dr. Carrie Nixon is a consultant forensic psychologist. She was asked to consult on some of Britain's most infamous killer kids for a TV show that was coming out called mm -hmm. Killer Kids. Oh, she spoke about how generally people who commit murder or acts of extreme violence have usually got troubled backgrounds. Um, she's quoted as saying, that's the case for some of these perpetrators. But interestingly, with some of these cases, the series that she was consulting on covers, many of them haven't, which makes them quite unusual. So these are a couple of the, places, the people that she was asked to consult on. Uh, William Cornick, age 15, uh, stabbed his Spanish teacher, Anne McGuire, to death during class. During class. During class. William Cornick shocked the nation when he stabbed his teacher uh, during Spanish class in April of 2014. 
He left his classmates in a state of shock when he casually walked up to Miss McGuire and stabbed her seven times while she was writing on the whiteboard. He was described as a clever child from a loving middle-class home and a very unlikely perpetrator for this crime. The teacher in charge of his year said he was a delightful pupil who always gave his best, while fellow pupils at school said he was just a typical guy who rarely misbehaves. Dr. Carey said he doesn't fit the profile of what they would normally see. As a forensic psychologist, I can honestly say that the majority of murderers or violent offenders that I've worked with, whether that's young people or adults, have got that history of dysfunctional and chaotic life. Mm -hmm. There were some dark sides of his personality, but it's easy if, uh, for us to un, uh, un, unpick that with hindsight. Mm -hmm. She suggested that Cornick came from a dysfunctional family and had previous convictions. Had he had those, people may have taken his threats to kill his teacher more seriously. I think people thought his disturbing behavior was just him being a bit bizarre, a bit dark. Mm -hmm. There was evidence of personality disorder and psychopathic traits, although you can't diagnose somebody at that age because he's far too young. But some of his behavior was evidence of that. People talked about him being a loner, a bit odd, but didn't consider him a genuine threat because he didn't have those risk factors. She said bystander apathy also came into play, with people presuming someone else would raise concern about the violent threats he was making. Mm -hmm. Nobody takes on the responsibility for reporting it themselves because they assume somebody else is doing it. Yep. I think also we'd be quite surprised and troubled if we could hear a lot of the conversations that go on between adolescents, especially on social media. I think a lot of adolescents make some quite throwaway comments and threats, but they don't take each other seriously. Anne McGuire's family, the teacher, say they still don't know what caused him to kill except for a severe hatred of her. Cornick told a psychologist, I wasn't in shock. I was happy. I had a sense of pride. I still do. The criminal also said that after killing, after the killing, that he thought everything he had done was fine and dandy. Speaking about the nature versus nurture debate, Carrie said the two are very much entwined because a person's environment impacts on their brain. Mm -hmm. But the fact that Cornick showed no remorse makes one question whether the makes one question whether there's something within him that drove him to commit such an unprecedented atrocity. Interesting. It's wild. That is wild. I mean, I don't know. They're just, they're kids. What makes them think that, what mentally pushes them to do that? Yeah, and the, the instances where there's no, like, background where you can look at history of things and it's like oh they were troubled as a kid or they had this mental illness or whatever it's just that people who seem completely normal yeah it's that's just, the weirdest thing that was just something just because it was a psychologist yeah I just touch on that. um so these are <laughs> there's probably gonna be a couple that people know obviously uh, john venables and robert thompson age 10 mm. this one you will know Sure. In the winter of 1993, John Venables and Robert Thompson, both 10-year-olds at the time, became the youngest convicted murderers in England. On February 12, 1993, the boys abducted two-year-old James Bulger from a local shopping mall. The boys brought him to a local railroad track where they brutally beat the boy before using an iron bar to do most of the damage. They finally left him to die on the railroad tracks. Somehow, despite the grisly murder, both boys were released from prison in 2001 when they turned 18, and now they live under new identities. Do you know that one? No, I had never heard that one. Really? There's like security camera footage of it, too. Oh, shit. Eric Smith, age 13. After enduring years of bullying because of his glasses and red hair, 13-year-old Eric Smith finally snapped one day and murdered... Four-year-old Derek Roby on August 2nd, 1993. Both boys were walking to their summer day camp when Smith decided to lure the young boy into the woods. There he strangled and killed the boy using a large rock. Roby's body was found soon after and Smith was convicted of second-degree murder and sentenced the most a juvenile could be, at least nine years in prison. Since then, Smith has been denied parole eight times since 2002 this article uh, that I read is a bit old, but mm -hmm. in uh, most in most recently, he won't be eligible again until 2018. So this was like 2017. Yeah. 
um, Mary Floral, Flora Bell, age 11. On May 25th, 1968, the day before her 11th birthday, Mary Flora Bell lured four-year-old Martin Brown to an abandoned home in Newcastle, England. Bell then strangled him to death and soon returned to carve an M on his chest. Two months later, Bell and her friend Norma were on the prowl again, this time taking three-year-old Brian Howe into their possession, where they also strangled him to death. Damn. The two deaths were eventually connected, and Bell was charged with two counts of manslaughter. After 12 years, when Bell was 23, she was released from prison and also given a new identity to start a new life. Lionel Tate, 13. On July 28, 1999, Lionel Tate's mother was babysitting six-year-old Tiffany Eunuch when she decided to go upstairs to watch television. Once she left the room, 13-year-old Lionel began abusing the young girl, mostly by stomping on her. After nearly 45 minutes with her, Lionel went to get his mom after she stopped breathing and blamed it on a wrestling accident. Tate was sentenced to life in prison, becoming the youngest American ever to face the charge. He's seen here, um, this picture, he's seen here after receiving his sentence as his defense team comforts him. So it's basically him just looking at the cameras. Mm. He looks pissed. Since mental competency was not conducted before the trial, the charge was overturned as Tate was released from prison only three years later with one year house arrest and 10 years probation. Wow. Jesse Pomeroy, 11. Beginning in 1871, when he was only 11 years old, James Pomeroy began luring younger boys into remote areas where he would torture them by beating them or cutting them with a knife. As Pomeroy's family moved around Massachusetts, James continued his attack on young boys. He was eventually arrested and tried in juvenile court, where he was sentenced and sent to a reform school. When he turned 14, James was sent to live with his mother in South Boston, when soon after he murdered 10-year-old girl Katie Coran in March of 1874. Pomeroy was sentenced to death, but it would be overturned and changed to life in prison. Joshua Phillips, 14. In the fall of 98, 14-year-old Joshua Phillips allegedly was playing baseball with a baseball bat when he struck 8-year-old Maddie Clifton in the head. He later told police that he stabbed her in the neck when she wouldn't stop crying. He then took her body and hid her in his waterbed mattress, where she remained for more than a week. It wasn't until Joshua's mother noticed a leak in the bed and went to investigate that she found the body of the young girl that called the police. Ooh. Phillips would later be charged with first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison. Oh, my God. George Stinney Jr., 14. In June of 1944, 14-year-old George Stinney Jr. brutally beat and killed 11-year-old Betty June Binnaker and 8-year-old Mary Emma Thames before burying both of their bodies in a mud hole. Stinney confessed that, confessed that he intended to have sex with Betty but ended up killing her instead, likely when she refused. After only a two-hour-long trial, Stinney was sentenced to death, the youngest person to receive the death, set, the death sentence in the country. Alyssa uh, Bustamante, 15. 15-year-old 15 Missouri teen Alyssa showed all the signs of a troubled teen from cutting herself to attempting suicide. With her depression and deeply rooted mental issues unresolved, the emotions grew into anger. One day in 2009, Alyssa lured her neighbor, nine-year-old Elizabeth Olton, into the woods, where she strangled her before slitting her neck and wrists. She buried Olton in the ground in one of two holes she prepared earlier in the week. Alyssa would eventually plead guilty to the murder, claiming that she wanted to know what it was like to kill someone. She was charged with first-degree murder and tried as an adult, getting life imprisonment. Mm -hmm. Craig Price, 15. In 1989, 15-year-old Rhode Island teen Craig Price brutally stabbed and killed 39-year-old Joan Heaton and her two daughters, 10-year-old Jennifer and 8-year-old Melissa. Price was already a suspect in a previous murder investigation, and when police came in to question him, he was found with wounds on his body and the murder weapons in his room with dried blood. Gotta hide those. Mm -hmm. Before his 16th birthday... Craig was convicted on four counts of murder as a minor, which meant he would be released by the age of 21. 
However, he was sentenced to an additional 10 to 25 years in prison thanks to a group called Citizens Opposed to the Release of Craig Price. Oh. He had his own group. Wow. Willie Boskett, 15. Notorious killer Willie Boskett was troubled from the moment he was born, as his father was also a murderer serving life in prison in Milwaukee. Boskett committed dozens of crime around New York City, and eventually his first murder by the time he was 15. He first shot and killed two men during separate robbery attempts back in 78. He also killed a transit employee before getting caught. Boskett pleaded guilty to the murders, but since he was only 15, he was tried as a minor and only received five years in a youth facility. His life sentence would bring about historic change as New York would become the first state to change juvenile laws to allow kids as young as 13 to be tried as adults. Mm. It was called the Willie Boskett Law. Mm. Upon being released, Boskett continued a life of crime, going in and out of jail until finally receiving a life sentence in 89. Isn't that fucking crazy? Do something so fucked up you get a law named after you? Yeah, right? Oh my god. I have a couple more if you want me to keep going. Yeah. Uh, Lorraine Thorpe. She became Britain's youngest female double murderer. When age 15, she smothered her father, Desmond Thorpe, to death in the hope he wouldn't tell the police about her killing a stranger. Rosalind Hunt, following a row, a fight over a dog in 2009. Miss Hunt, 41, was beaten to death in Ipswich over several days, with Thorpe responsible for kicking, punching, and stamping on her head. Her father, 43, a vulnerable alcoholic, was smothered amid fears that he would tell the police about her first crime. She was given a life sentence with the judge ruling she had been brought up with no real understanding of what is right and what is wrong. Mm -hmm. She was convicted of taking part in the crime with 40-year-old Paul Clark, who five years later was found dead in his cell. Thorpe, now 24, was told she must serve at least 14 years behind bars as she was sentenced at the Old Bailey. Mr. Justice Saunders said she could be manipulative and was not acting entirely under Clark's control, adding she found violence funny and entertaining. The judge said that Clark, also an alcoholic, was the instigator of the murder of Miss Hunt, although Thorpe played a full part. Far from being sorry, Lorraine appears to have gloried in it, describing to her friends at one stage how she stamped on Rosalind's head. Ridiculous. Hmm. James Fairweather. Fifteen. He was only 15 when he stabbed a young father and a female student in Colchester, Essex, claiming voices in his head told him to sacrifice the pair for committing sins. Fairweather was branded a monster at Guildford Crown Court in 2016 when he was found guilty of two murders and was sentenced at the Old Bailey by Mr. Justice Spencer, who said the, brooding, the killer's killings were brutal and sadistic. He was caught after a dog walker spotted him lurking in the woods, lying in wait for his next victim. After his arrest, he admitted he had been hunting down a third victim. His first victim was a disabled 33-year-old father of five, James Atfield, who was stabbed 102 times Whoa. during a frenzied three-minute attack in 2014 of March. Three months later, the five-foot-six schoolboy, who was obsessed with killers, including the Yorkshire whip, uh, Ripper, Whipper, attacked Saudi PhD student Nahid Almania, 31, knifing her 16 times with a 10-inch bayonet on a public footpath. Both victims were stabbed in their eyes. During the two-week trial, the jury was shown clips from Fairweather's police interviews in which he provided chilling details of his attack on Mr. Atwood Fairweather, who told a psychiatrist he could have killed another 15 victims, committed the murders under the noses of his parents, the Twilight Killers, Kim Edwards and Lucas Markham. Both 14. Kim Edwards was just 14 when she enlisted the help of her boyfriend, Lucas Markham, to kill her mother, Elizabeth Edwards, 49, and her sister, Katie, at their home in the village of Spalding, Lincolnshire, in April of 2016. Edwards and Markham, believed to be Britain's youngest double murderers, became known as the Twilight Killers as they went downstairs and calmly watched the vampire films together just after the brutal murders. Mm. 
In his police interview, Markham described with a complete lack of emotion how he killed Elizabeth and Katie Edwards by stabbing them in the neck. There's a timeline of the events. So and they watched Twilight. What? And then they watched Twilight. And then they watched Twilight. May 23rd, 2015. Kim Edwards and Lucas Markham begin their relationship shortly before he was excluded from Sir John Gleed's school just a year before the murders. March 17th, 2016. Edwards, who had been assessed by mental health professionals after expressing suicidal thoughts, makes an attempt on her own life and spends two days in hospital. April 11th of the same year. During a conversation in the back garden of the Edwards family home, Markham and his girlfriend agree to kill mother and sister. April 13th, Markham smothers and stabs both victims through the neck. April 14th, Edwards and Markham are reported missing to the police by their school and his aunt. April 15th, police find Miss Edwards and Katie dead in their beds. Both defendants are arrested on suspicion of murder. April 17th, both teenagers are charged with two counts of murder. September 16th, Edwards and Markham both admit manslaughter but plead not guilty to murder. O October 10th, Markham admits murder and is remanded in custody. October 11th, Edwards is found guilty of murder by a unanimous verdict. November 10th, Edwards and Markham are both given life sentences with minimum terms of 20 years. June 9th, 2017, their minimum terms are reduced to 17 years. The Court of Appeal, which also rules, they can be named. So their information is released. Mm-hmm. The lovers hatched the gruesome plot after Elizabeth tried to break them up and also as revenge because Edwards believed her mother favored her sister Katie over her. The clinical justifications they gave for their crimes in police interviews were so startlingly, were so startling, officers took the unprecedented decision to make the recording public because of the danger they believed the teenagers represented to society. Whoa. Isn't that Let's just... So you can listen to that somewhere. Yep. Right? Mm-hmm. The recordings? Yeah, I just didn't want to look for them. I wonder uh, I wonder if they still got to be together and watch Twilight in prison. I mean, aren't prisons separated by gender? And I don't think they're going to allow conjugal visions for teenagers. But Twilight... I'm pretty sure they broke up. Twilight, though. Joshua Davies, 15, lured Rebecca uh, Aylward to a secluded spot in Bridgen, South Wales, where he killed her by bashing her over the head with a rock so he could win a bet over a free fried breakfast. Oh, yeah. In January 2010, Davies ended his relationship with Rebecca for another girl. She then found another partner, only for her ex-boyfriend to persuade her to end it and meet up with him. In the court case following the year, it emerged that in the time before the meetup in October, the killer had been publishing hateful materia about Rebecca online and bragging to friends that he was going to poison her with plants like deadly nightshade or push her over a quarry into a river. Becker never told me that it was abusive, but there must have been some controlling element looking back now, Rebecca's mother, Sonia Oatley, later said. In January 2010, he left Becca for another girl. She was absolutely devastated, and I, hate, I hated seeing her so hurt. But in time, she started going out with another boy herself, only for him to convince her to end it and meet up with him. She did so almost instantaneously, thrilled at the thought of their reconciliation. As the day of the meetup wore on, concerns started to grow as Rebecca failed to return home. Mm. After a night of searching, Rebecca's body was found at around 9 a.m. the next day, the wooded area that she was found in was said to have been popular with teenagers. Davies, who had since turned 16, was accused of Rebecca's murder after bludgeoning her to death with a large rock. With Rebecca's mother sitting in court alongside family and friends, the horrifying details of what happened that day began to emerge. It was heard that Davies had told a friend he was going into the forest with, Be with Rebecca and smiled as he said, the time has come. The same friend later phoned Davies to ask if he was with Rebecca. The defendant replied with two words, define with. After summoning the fellow 16-year-old into the forest, the murderer then told his friend he had hit Rebecca from behind with a rock until she stopped screaming, before discarding the bloody weapon into the undergrowth. His demeanor was described merely as cool. Together, the boys went home in full knowledge that Rebecca's body lay in the woods behind them. Davies even sent texts to Rebecca's phone, knowing she was dead, pleading with her to let her people know where she was. 
So this is called Gang of Sword. Uh, five teenagers attacked and murdered a man in a Liverpool laundrette when two of them were only 13 in September of 2013. The gang chased Sean McHugh, 19, into a laundrette and killed him. As he lay dying in hospital, the boys sent each other a series of chilling messages mocking their victim. The Crown Court heard gang member Kiefer D uh, Dykstra? Dykstra? just 14 at the time of the murder, posted on Facebook, RIP Shorty, we always knew ye was a pussy. Shockingly, 11 people liked the comment. Mm. Kiefer, who was 14, and Corey Hewitt, then 13, plus his 15-year-old cousin, Andrew Hewitt, and Joseph McGill, who was also just 13 at the time of the attack, were all convicted of the vicious and brutal murder, along with 19-year-old Reese O'Shaughnessy. Recorder of Liverpool, Clement Goldston, took the unusual step of naming the young gang members after a jury found them guilty. Mm -hmm. Victim, Mr. Hugh McHugh, had been walking down the street with friend Josh Williams when they were approached by some of the gang. As Mr. Williams sought refuge inside a nearby news agent, Mr. McHugh, who was known as Shorty, was chased back into the laundrette they'd just come from. O'Shaughnessy, who was carrying a sword stick, a walking cane with a blade hidden inside, and Dijkstra, armed with a knife, arrived a short time later, and the gang kicked the back door of the shop open. Prosecutors were unable to prove just who struck the fatal blow, but argued that all involved in the attack were guilty of murder. 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 Whether they held the blade or not. Right. The boys were slammed by a detective in the case who said they had shown little remorse for their actions. The senior police officer also said he heard the boys laughing and joking as they sat in the dock. That's it. It's chilling. It's upsetting. It is upsetting. Like, what the fuck? You're children. Yeah, for people to be so young and pulling this shit. <clears throat> I want to say, hang on. You're children. You have your whole life ahead of you. Do you think you're going to get away with murder? They you're a child. They don't think these things through like that. I mean, obviously, some of them have mental health issues or, you know, aren't of sound mind. Uh -huh. But <laughs> just to, to live in this cloud in your head that you're invincible and you'll get away with this. You don't know how to hide evidence. You don't have that kind of materials at, at hand that you can get away with these things. Right. Us us as grown adults are aware of all these things, but ah. children who don't have that life experience are sort of living in the moment and living with the information that – the little information that they've had in their that life. That makes it more brutal. Yeah. Because they do it on such strong impulse that it is such – Yep baser obviously some of them are methodical some of them planned the murder but you know 15 years old 13 years old and you're you know you're like i'm gonna murder someone mm -hmm. you know and I, I think that's why i'm uh i argue so much for the um the nurture component of like how these kids are raised, what kind of environment are they growing up in, what things are they exposed to, and what thoughts are going through their mind that aren't being addressed either by their parents or maybe these concerns are falling on deaf ears. No, They think no one's listening to them. They think no one cares for them, loves them, understands their concerns. And then it just builds and builds and builds until they finally act on something. Mm -hmm. That's how I feel like. I mean, I feel like your upbringing is a strong component to how these kids act. But it's, as you discussed, it's not always the case. It could just be someone thinking of something and not being in a uh, um, rational state of mind to just act on it. Yeah. I looked at... Uh, it's like intrusive thoughts to the extreme. Yes. yeah, Intrusive thoughts and you're you're acting on, on them because you don't think them through enough because, I don't know. You're a child. Multiple reasons. Yeah. And you're a child. Um, I was looking... There's a list on Wikipedia of the uh, youngest killers 
like notable killers, I, sh- mm-hmm. I guess. Um, obviously, all of them aren't recorded there, but you can sort by year. They have it split into a couple sections. And the youngest killers that I saw were three, three years old. The youngest one on that list was a three-year-old, I think, from Syria, mm-hmm. who um, uh, the child and mother were kidnapped by ISIS. Mm-hmm. And I don't know what happened to the mom, but the child was persuaded by ISIS to kill someone else, uh, presumably with a gun, I imagine. Mm-hmm. And this three-year-old killed someone with a gun. Um, and I can't even get two-year-olds to hold fucking crayons. How do you get a three-year-old to hold a gun? <laughs> yeah, I don't know how they managed to do that, but that was chilling when I when I saw that too. And and then some of these ones that happened like a century ago, two centuries ago. It's like unnamed boy or boy A or girl A, mm-hmm. and it's like people doing people murdering others in school. Mm-hmm. And it's like just reading how how this stuff happened. It's like oh god. Yeah, we didn't even talk about. School shootings. Yeah. Yeah, that's a whole other thing. But, um, <coughs> no, I think it's a good episode that, that just talks about murder in general. And then we, you know, the topic was child murders. So mm-hmm. precisely what we covered. I mm-hmm. think, uh, it was good information, but it's, it was crazy. I was doing this research. I was like, what the fuck are we doing? <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> but it's, it's sad. It's crazy. What'd you think of the beer? I love it. Two a.m. It, uh, fuck it is. Mm-hmm. It's two in the morning. You should not wake her up. No, I'm not going to. Um, I really enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. I liked it. It was fantastic. Uh, it was definitely out of a lot of the fruit, or out of all the fruit beers we have, we've had that one might have been the most fruit forward. Mm-hmm. Uh, the fruit was there, sweet, sour, exactly as it was described. Tasted like watermelon, uh, Sour Patch Kids. A lot of watermelon there. Very fizzy, tingly, um, very sour, uh, lemony, and uh, a lot of watermelon. It reminded me of um, the beer that we did for... um, Secret Savages? Grizzly Bears? No. The Guyana one. Um, The Kool-Aid. All the people committed suicide at the Kool-Aid. That was the one I couldn't drink. Fruit Yes. Yeah, the fruit punch. It reminded me of the fruit punch one because mm. that one was also very fruit forward. Mm. Uh, I don't think it was necessarily a sour ale. I can't really remember right now, but um, that one and then this one, I, I recall. I don't know about the the grizzly bear one. Oh, the grizzly bear one was the St. Arant beer. That was delicious. Nope. Huh? That was a Three Floyds beer and it was watermelon sour ale. For grizzly bears, are you sure? Sacred savages. Because the Grizzly Bears one was the one that Jack was here for. Yep. The one with the little... Oh, yeah. He didn't try the uh, the, uh, the St. Laurent nope. beer. He w- or he wasn't here with the episode. We gave him one. But, yeah, that's right. That wa- that was watermelon. Yeah. This is this is definitely takes the cake. Uh, delicious. I'd drink it again. Yeah, this one. Oh, yeah. That's right. Yep, that was Grizzly Bears. I would drink that again. It was fantastic. I liked it. You? It was very accurate to its description. Mm-hmm. It, it was so sweet and tart that it gave me extreme goosebumps. I had a cocktail before this, so I don't really want to drink a lot because um, my tummy is like a little... <laughs> blah, blah, blah. Um, I also don't think that I would want to drink a full can of that because it is just kind of a lot. It's intense, yeah. It is. Yeah, for me, sour ales are hard to drink a lot of. Sure. Because it's just like, that's very overwhelming on my palate. Yeah. It's just kind of like, oh, this is too much. Um, it was definitely watermelon. But I will say, as we were talking about Secret Savages, it was much more enjoyable than Secret Savages because it yeah. wasn't, I don't know what the huge difference between the two of them is. I feel like Secret Savages didn't have that much watermelon behind it. No, these guys went balls to the wall with their they watermelon. They went balls to the wall with watermelon. Yeah. They're like, this is going to be a watermelon beer. Someone get us 200 pounds of watermelon. Yeah. <laughs> I don't dislike it, mm-hmm. but when I drink a beer, I want to be able to drink the whole thing. Mm-hmm. You know? So that kind of knocks it down for me a bit. That it's just like, oh, this is this is overwhelming. Yeah. 
Ale really liked it. She had like three or four sips of it. Mm. She really enjoyed it. Um, I would, yeah, I would drink. I I probably wouldn't have one and then immediately another one. Yeah. Uh, like you were saying, it's like something to enjoy and try. But I didn't, I didn't hate it, and I would happily buy it and try it again. Mm-hmm. It's tasty. Our website's beerandfearcast dot com. We're on uh, all the popular podcast platforms. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts, you can listen to Beer and Fear new episodes every Wednesday at noon at Central Time. And then uh, our YouTube videos where you can watch the episodes live. They're released the same day, same time, every week. Check everything out at beerandfearcast.com. Have a good one.